Welcome to the press conference announcing the 171st season of the New York Philharmonic. Seems like yesterday. <laughs> but you know, this, what you're seeing up there, is going out on, into Cyber World on their website of the New York Philharmonic and WQXI, and we welcome all the viewers. Today we're going to have a number of guests, as we've had in the past. Uh, but I wanted to start off by welcoming all of you, really thanking WQXR for hosting us for a second year. Uh, this is a wonderful space. I think many of you have come here and heard lovely concerts. I don't know if Graham Parker and Laura Walker are here, but anyway, thanks to them if they are. And I wanted to say that this has been a real pleasure to work with Alan these last three years. This is the fourth season of Alan's that we are announcing. And that also seems just like yesterday. I mean, I still have the image in my mind of introducing Alan to the orchestra, announcing it first to them uh, at Center Park in 2008. And I announced to the orchestra that the next music director standing behind the tent, and then Alan walked out with me. And uh, I mean, a real marriage was born at that time, if I can say that. And I can't tell you how pleased and proud I am of having made that appointment. Uh, we've just come back from a three-week tour of Europe and in not inconsequential places, Paris, London, Amsterdam, Köln, Frankfurt. And I have to say that in the many tours I've done over the last 30 years, this is probably the most gratifying tour. <clears throat> From a musical, organizational, um, audience reaction, reaction of our, our contemporaries and the people in our business, which is, for me, is the most important element as to how we are received and how quickly they come back and say, well, when is the next time you're going to come to the Concert Gabao? And can we do it in the next couple of years? Those are the things that are gratifying to me. And everybody knows, and it's fair to say that when we announced Alan, I didn't have any problems, but a lot of people said, well, you're taking a big chance. I didn't think we were taking a chance. And I think the three years that have gone by so far have proved that. Um, the orchestra is playing better than I've ever heard them. I think the programming is something that is extremely stimulating. Uh, as Alan has always said, there's a story, there's the sort of the new with the old. And I'll let him talk more about it, but I just have had a wonderful time these four years working with him, planning. And I think my success to Mr. Van Beesen, who starts next week, is going to have a real ride. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Alan, and say publicly thank you. I'm 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 moved to hear you hear you speak this way, and and this is a uh, a bittersweet moment for me. I, I I love I've grown to love making these season announcements, and it's hard to believe that this is the fourth one, because time has gone by so quickly. It does seem like yesterday, and I remember these moments also extremely well. Um, but it's bittersweet because uh, this is the last one I'll do with you on stage together. And I felt incredibly supported, incredibly strongly and warmly supported. Um, you may not have thought you were taking a chance, but I felt you were taking a chance when you, when you, when you, when you appointed me. And I was very, very uh, honored and uh, challenged. And um, the fact that it has gone as well as it has, um, I owe enormously and overwhelmingly to you because you know as i've been trying to shape a vision my vision it's really been useful and 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 i can't overstate the importance that that it has 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 uh, meant for me to feel supported and to be confirmed in the choices that we're making and i think we've taken a lot of a lot of risks and 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 um, the fact that you were Willing to go with that has really meant a lot, and I know that I personally, but not just me, everybody in the in the or organization will 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 miss you uh, enormously. So, 
if we could just take a moment and, and salute Zara and Meta for everything we've done. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, ever since Alan took over as music director. Uh, I moved here in 2006 and have been coming regularly to concerts at the Philharmonic. And I think as sort of an outsider, if you will, before I joined the organization, there were a lot of things about the Philharmonic that I admired and that I was excited about as, a, as an audience member before I became a staff member, the fact that there were these interdisciplinary artistic collaborations going on, lots of interesting composers becoming part of the Philharmonic family, um, the way programs were put together, and um, especially the theatrical experiences that you and Doug Fitch, um, who we'll introduce later, have brought into the concert hall at Avery Fisher Hall. So my attitude coming in was just to keep those ideas coming to amplify what has been do what has been done and maybe give a little, you know, suggest a few twists to things along the way. And it's been so much fun to work with Alan and Zarin because we really all three of us come to the table and there's no um, sense of, of limitation. We throw everything on the table and some of it is good and some of it is not great. <laughs> and we sift through it together and we balance each other out and, and we bring our different passions and our our different viewpoints to things and what emerges hopefully is something that is cohesive and something that all three of us believe in and that the rest of the organization believes in and that we can uh, provide to our New York audiences. Shall we uh, dive we'll in and start? Go into the season and I think I'll leave you two to talk about it. Okay. Right, we'll, do our we'll do our best. Right. I want to listen yeah, to okay. what you have to say. <laughs> in interestingly, Ed, um, I was already speaking with, with a, uh, a member of, of the of the press in the in the foyer before before the conference and and a comment was made already about the opening week and the fact that the that with Leif Ove. yeah and the fact that our gala gala performance that's uh, that's traditionally the, w the way we open is not actually right at the beginning of the season and I really enjoyed the process that led led to this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the opening of a season is a celebration that goes beyond any single night. And the fact that our opening, the very first performance of next season, it happens to be a subscription concert with Leif Oveansnes, with a program that includes uh, your first rite of spring with the orchestra. And that later we have a very festive evening with, with our board member and our favorite violinist, one of our favorite violinists, Itzhak Perlman, uh, and some orchestral yeah, We have lots pieces. of favorite We have lots of favorite violinists. <laughs> Yeah, beloved, one of our most beloved. Um, it makes for a great opening of the season. Um, the Kurtog, I think, came around by um, Leif Ove suggested that. I've loved making programs with Leif Ove over the years because he thinks in a, in a very, for me, consequent and intelligent way. He likes to combine pieces that may not suggest themselves on first at first blush to, to being presented together, but they always have have a resonance that, that is revealed by the juxtaposition. And this is such a case. He'll be playing uh, Beethoven Piano Concerto along with this, this smaller uh, sized work of Kurtag, Quasi Una Fantasia. And, and um, he's such a probing and intelligent musician. It just totally fits into, the, I think, the way we think about programming. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, we have a few other highlights of your, of your programs in the season, I think, to amplify on. Well, we should, we should talk about them. I mean, Zarin has already mentioned a number of things that are important to, to, to me and to the New York Philharmonic. Um, Anders Hilborg uh, will be writing a piece for Renee Fleming. She's, she's been great, and we've talked about lots of ideas, and she's definitely a, a case in which many of the ideas that we've talked about haven't come, but we were planning many, many things, and the first, first such collaboration is this world premiere commission of An Anders that uh, will, will be performed in Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we continue with the Nielsen cycle that has started and that we are in the middle of this season? We've performed and recorded the second symphony of Nielsen last year. The third is coming up this year. Next year, we're turning to the concertos. And this is, this is particularly exciting for me because I got to know the clarinet concerto and the flute concerto through the recordings that Lenny made with Julie Baker mm. and Stanley Drucker. I love the music of Nielsen, and I think that it is, um, for whatever reason, not considered uh, as, as seriously as it probably should be. Um, you know, Sibelius has had his day. Um, Mahler certainly has had his day, but Nielsen is a composer who, who um, I think speaks to, to everybody. And, and um, 
I had this had this thought when when I was talking to the Da Capo record people. You know, I th I said, you know, Nielsen is is the composer that that the Philharmonic can really play incredibly and with a with a real um, insight and stylistic purity and and passion and and they were very excited so we we hatched this idea to to make a traversal and record the uh, the entire symphonic works of Nielsen uh, later in the season you come back to a work that has been very important as I would say a cornerstone in your relationship with the Philharmonic you must be referring to the Ives fourth symphony I am <laughs> um, um, Thanks for the chance to talk about it. Um, uh, no, it, it is, you know, there have been some pieces that have come back already in my, um, uh, in my time here as music director, but this is, um, this, is the, this is the first work that I consciously thought, you know what, let's do it again. I, I, I did the Ives Fourth Symphony, I think it was back in 2004, um, as part of a, an Ives Festival that the orchestra was presenting. Of course, I was a guest then, and it was a, huge, and I'm not gonna lie to you, daunting challenge to put together that very complicated program with the amount of time that we had to do it. There were, there were a number of programs in a very compressed period of time. And somehow it all came together, and the experience in the concert, it was the first time I had, I had ever done, done the piece, um, was really life-changing for me. I think it's, it's one of the great 20th century masterpieces. I mean, amazingly, it's from, you know, Hundred years ago, or something—it's—it's it's thought of as a contemporary work, but it's—it's—it's it's, it's not really. Um, but what he does does feel so modern and so contemporary and so transcendent and so telling for 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 human human nature, and 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 uh, it really touches a spiritual realm. The orchestra was unbelievable, and they put it together in a way that I really, to this day don't quite understand, uh, and I, I admire what they did. So we decided, okay, this is the first work actually that I'm consciously repeating mm -hmm. with the New York Philharmonic. We haven't actually repeated any other work. Some concertos have come, come back with different soloists and on tours, of course, but as a programming decision and a subscription week, this is the first one. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to do that because I do feel that that was a kind of real meeting uh, between me and, and the orchestra, and it meant a lot to me, and I'm really excited to, to bring it back to, to New York City, because I think it's, it remains one of the most important works uh, in the repertoire. When you did the Ives Fourth before you became music director of the Philharmonic, was it on a program that was all Ives? I'm trying to remember. No, it was, um, there were Mahler and Copeland songs. Uh -huh. um, it, was a, it was a fascinating program, and, and um, and uh, you know, if that's not enough already, Berg three pieces for orchestra. It was, you know, it was it was incredible. Yeah. We're taking a slightly different direction with Ives four this season. I it's think. all American on this program. Yeah. Um, Bernstein Serenade with Josh Bell, and uh, a new work by by Christopher Rouse that we've asked, uh, we've commissioned, and uh, yeah. and uh, we'll we'll hear more from Chris later when he comes to the stage. Yeah. Um, I wanted to maybe mention one other uh, Im thing that I'm really looking forward to, which is we've had a long relationship at the Philharmonic with the American composer Stephen Stuckey, and we've co-commissioned a work with the LA Philharmonic where he was the composer in residence and the consulting composer for new music for a long time. Um, he's writing a, a new symphony, actually. He's calling it deliberately a symphony, which uh, is a title that he has avoided for a long time, but he, I think he's ready to assume that mantle. So we'll look forward to that piece coming into being as well. Yeah, I love his music. We're actually playing, playing a piece of his this week, Sonny Lumiere, a very right. early work from over 25 years ago uh, this, uh, in this, this week's program. He's, he's been an important person uh, in the Philharmonic family, and uh, this will be a yeah. nice new it, project. It, there's sort of inadvertently a little Stucky Festival going on because Pittsburgh, with Manfred Honick, who will conduct the New York Philharmonic next season, for the first time is bringing the Pittsburgh Symphony to New York shortly with a new piece by Stephen as well. So New York will get to hear a lot of this great composer. And speaking of great American composers, I thought maybe this might be a, a nice time to introduce the newest member of the Philharmonic family. Unless well, there were other things that no, we wanted no, to talk no, no. about first. No, no, no. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time actually. Um, we, no, it's always a good time um, <laughs> to introduce Chris Rouse as our new composer in residence. Um, the the position of composer in residence has has been, I think, uh, a really 
really crucial one in, in, our, in our constellation here um, for a lot of reasons. Magnus Lindbergh, who's been doing it for the last two and a half years, um, is first of all a great composer. Um, and he's a complete musician. He's, he's a pianist. He's a conductor. Um, and I've said it before, but the in-residence part of this, this notion has been really imp important. And I was curious and optimistic, but um, really gratified in the event um, as Magnus really became a true family member, not just for the orchestra and the organization internally, but I think for the audience. And you could really feel that over the, over the years when he would come out on stage each time. There was more and more a palpable sense of recognition. Um, he wrote pieces for us, he performed with us, um, but also he was very important in, in advising um, us and bringing his point of view and his sensibility to, to the programming. Not just new music, I should say, um, because he's, he's interested in the very connections that we're, we're interested in, but it's been a, in a real, been a real success. So when Chris agreed to, to be his successor, I, was, I couldn't have been more thrilled because Chris has long been one of the composers that, that I've admired. I think he is, he's got an ear for sound and a sense of, of human psychology, uh, if I might uh, be so bold, that is really penetrating and really keen. And I literally have never heard one note of Chris that doesn't actually speak to me as a, as a deep and, and, and powerful um, philosophical statements. So um, the fact that he's a professor at Juilliard and is, is, is already well connected to the New York community is, is also extremely important. But I think that he will join the orchestra and, and, and serve in some ways as Mungs has, but also bring his own, own, own personality, obviously, to the situation. So shall we ask Chris to join us on the stage? Welcome. Thank you, Chris. You, you were, you were. I, I think um, when I when I asked you about this idea, you said, "Yeah, sure, I'll do it." Um, and 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 uh, did you and, know what you were saying? Yes. And that's 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 my that's exactly my question. Did you did you did you did you have an idea of of this kind of the range of things that that we were going to to ask you to do? And and how do you feel about about what you are being sort of tasked with. Oh, well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing this. Uh, uh, Magnus uh, Lindbergh is a good friend, so actually we had spoken before. Uh, I just was curious to know what he was doing before you even invited what, me. What did he say, actually? <laughs> <laughs> that was a privileged conversation. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, he was very, he was thrilled. He was very happy to be here and uh, enjoyed the experience, was enjoying the experience very much. And I did serve as composer in residence long ago with the Baltimore Symphony, so I've had some experience with that kind of uh, uh, an organization. So uh, I was just uh, delighted, though, to be asked by the Philharmonic, which is an orchestra that is very, very dear to my heart, has been since I was a child, and to have a chance to work with them and with you, who have been such a great champion of my work, is something that... Uh, is 100% pleasurable for me. I know it will be. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I've, I've uh, for those of you who may not be aware, I've, I've been doing recordings of Chris's music with the Stockholm Philharmonic, my former orchestra, and we really got to know each other well because um, Chris was there, uh, wasn't there all the time uh, when we were rehearsing and performing. But I would call him and ask him questions, and and the musical discussions we had about his own music were were fascinating for me and uh, you know there's some composers that you feel they're not quite aware of what they've actually put down on the page but that's not the case with Chris it's so well considered and so musically conceived if I might might say um, so we'll be doing some older works and some newer works is there anything you particularly want to uh, highlight for us well I um, of course the the new piece that I'll be writing for you is uh, something that's still a little amorphous there's not much I can tell you about it yet but I'm kind of getting some vague sense of what that might be. It's an opener, concert opener. Um, uh, Fantasmata is uh, actually the first orca real orchestra commission I had back uh, in 1985 from the St. Louis Symphony. So it, uh, I guess, qualifies as kind of a golden oldie. It's from my wild child days. <laughs> um, 
And um, they're just coming to an end, I think. These, these <laughs> well, days, uh, yeah. I don't have the energy to write all those notes anymore. You know, this, every page is just full of of uh, tutti fortissimo writing. Um, and uh, seeing which uh, the orchestra commissioned, um, and I believe premiered in 1999, and then did a few years later again, both times with Emmanuel Axe, uh, for whom I wrote it. Um, I'm I'm thrilled that it's being revived yet again. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll really uh, be excited to hear it. It's important to bring back works that I think have been commissioned by the Philharmonic and to bring them back and work them into the repertoire that way. And I'm really glad that we're doing that. Oh, I, I am too. Well, that, that it's, unfortunately, it is often the case. And perhaps I might even say deserved, but some new pieces don't get played that often. But when it's a real composer and a real piece, as, as is almost always the case, I think uh, with your, your music, of course we should do it. And I'll never forget my first time hearing, seeing an Aspen. That was a performance with Manny, and that really struck me. And I haven't done it, so I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to that. Ed, do you want to take us through contact and maybe if Chris has any comments because we've all really worked on this together. Absolutely. Um, contact the new music series of the Philharmonic, which Alan started when he began his tenure as music director, has, has uh, you know, I'd say we're, we're experimenting, which is the whole point of contact. And Chris, you've brought some uh, composers to the table for our musicians and for Alan and me to look at whom we were not familiar with. And I think that's really exciting that you've already had such an impact on the organization by making introductions to people that you believe in. Can you tell us a little bit about um, maybe Andy Akiho and Jude right. Vaklavic? Well, well I'm, uh, yeah, I'm thrilled uh, to have been able to have that uh, kind of impact so early on. Uh, yes, these are two young, really fabulous young composers. Andy Akiho is, uh, actually lives in New York and is uh, a percussionist by training, uh, but is uh, just a fabulously inventive young composer. Uh, Jude Vaklavic uh, is actually currently living in Utah, uh, teaching uh, out there, uh, but is a, a, a product of the Juilliard School and also is uh, a very different composer from Andy, but I think also an extraordinarily inventive and talented one. So I'm, uh, I'm really happy that the Philharmonic has commissioned pieces from both of them for the Contact series. I have to tell you that one of the great pleasures of my job is actually getting to send that email to a young American composer saying, out of the blue, the New York Philharmonic would like you to write a new piece. And the, the response is usually, Really? <laughs> so that, that's yeah. a really fun part of my job. And, mm. um, and with, the, uh, with Jude's piece and Andy's piece, we're going to do an existing piece by Andrew Norman, who's also a New York composer living in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, it will, will be a New York premiere of a piece called Try. And uh, a, a tip of the hat and maybe a, a bit of an anchor to the program is one of your, I would say, predecessors in the position yes. of composer in residence at the mm -hmm. New York Philharmonic, Jacob Druckmann, um, uh, who's whose music we haven't done recently very much, and this piece, Counterpoise, I think is one of his most beautiful. It's a, it's a fine work, and um, I guess uh, you know, he kind of qualifies now as the elder statesman on the program, but yeah. uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a wonderful piece of music, and so I'm thrilled that also that we're gonna be doing an all-American program. Yeah, yeah. And then in the spring, we're turning our sights to Europe, mm -hmm. and again, you brought some pieces that I wasn't, Alan and I did not specifically know, but were composers that we had long admired. Um, Paul Reuters and Anders Hilborg, obviously, who we have commissioned with Carnegie Hall for Renee Fleming. But um, this ecstatic Tivoli piece, you were very keen on, Chris. Yes. Uh, it's a kind of a wild piece. Uh, we mentioned earlier the uh, uh, work that Anders uh, Hilborg will be writing for uh, uh, Renee Fleming. Uh, but this is uh, another work uh, which shows him at his uh, wildest. It's, uh, he's, uh, he's a fascinating and, and wonderful uh, Swedish composer, and uh, it, uh, it's, I think, going to be a very exciting experience for people to hear. Uh, Paul Reuters from Denmark, uh, I think, you know, as you know, I'm very high on the music that's coming out of Scandinavia these days, and he's certainly another major voice in, in the music of our time. Um, so. Um, two, those two works will be played uh, on the second contact program along with uh, 
uh, uh, an American premiere of Unsuk Chin, mm-hmm. uh, I don't, it, Google On. Right. And, um, well, you know actually more about the Jan Robin piece than I, because that was a pre-existing commission, but... Yes, I actually wasn't around when the Robin was commissioned. Did that? I think it came from one of the orchestra members, didn't it? Yeah, it's it's an amazing piece, and I'm actually this is a, for me this is going to be a fun program to conduct because except for the Hilborg, I haven't played any music by the other three three composers, and uh, they're all composers that I've actually been really really excited to and and looking forward to 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 work with and and, and on for a long time. I think one of the things about contact that's really great and that it's it's be, I think is starting to become really part of the DNA of this series is that it is a way for the Philharmonic and for you Alan to to get to know composers that you may not have worked with before and to to kind of start to introduce them to the Philharmonic DNA. I definitely think of it as as a there's an experimental component yeah. to it and it's the possibility to try out composers um in 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 a way that that um that doesn't have as much heat in a way and I, there's nothing less important about contact but but with the smaller ensembles and with the with the smaller halls it it um has been a great way to get to know composers and and uh, such people as Sean Shepard who yeah. whom we got to know through that has has actually uh you know become someone that we're we're looking forward to 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 commissioning and other th- in other yeah. things in for bigger works I should take a moment to thank the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Symphony Space for partnering with us on Contact and for supporting our efforts with this. Yeah. Great. So I, you know, we, we need to talk about Emmanuel Axe, and actually, there's a real connection to to Chris because yeah. he he uh, he's doing seeing. He's he's right. doing seeing. Shall we see if we can uh, make contact? Manny, out are of you space there? With Manny. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm. I'm here. Hey, Whoa! Wow. Magic. Hi. Hey. Miraculous, miraculous as it may seem. <laughs> welcome, welcome home. It's great to have you back. Where are you, Manny? I am in Philadelphia, uh, almost late for a rehearsal. Oh, okay. Oh. We'll oh, keep it. Oh. We'll keep it brief. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They'll understand, Manny. Hi. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Yeah. <laughs> so, Manny is going to be our next artist in residence and, and I couldn't be happier and this is something that we've talked about for a while so Manny welcome um, we're gonna have a great time we've already had a great time you've had a long and distinguished history with the orchestra I mean uh, amazingly 100 performances what was it something like that and a, a member of the uh, Philharmonic Society now huge welcome Manny thank you well it's of course incredibly exciting and and I'm very privileged to be part of this. Uh, any any performance with the Philharmonic is a privilege, and this will be very special. You you had very um, interesting and specific ideas that you wanted to realize. Um, we've done our best to to get as many of them into the into the mix as possible. Um, do you want to? Uh, well, we're to gonna speak we're, we're gonna get to do a couple of of pieces which. Uh, I really love and uh, would love to have a chance to, to work on with you, uh, the, the Schoenberg Piano Concerto. Uh, I got a note from Katherine Johnson who said that uh, we're doing Bach D minor and Schoenberg, and apparently that exact coupling was done in 1958 by Glenn Gould. Whoa. So it's it's been a while, I guess. <laughs> Once again, proving that there are no new ideas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, in any case, uh, I'm I'm so looking forward to to working on those. The the Bach is is terrifying and exciting at the same time. I've never played a Bach concerto, and I'm just working away and trying to do my best and, you know, hoping for the best. Uh, the Schoenberg I've done a few times, but uh, it's a fabulous piece, and and I'm very excited about doing that. And of course, I'm extremely excited about doing. Mozart 503 also. Uh, the only connection that has to Schoenberg is that Schoenberg at some point, I believe, said that uh, there's a lot of music that's left to be written, great music that's left to be written in C major. <laughs> and there's nothing better in C major than K503. So I, I guess that's at least uh, at least some kind of connection. And I get to do Chris's piece again, uh, C which I've done a number of times now, uh, it has 
an incredible number of notes. It's very, very hard. Uh, I think that each time I've worked on it uh, over the years, I've gotten a few more things to go right. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, that this time will be better than the last time. And uh, he's very tolerant about things. So I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to Chris for that. <laughs> Manny, have we told you about the 25 concert world tour of seeing that we're going to be doing? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's all about Schumann and Moby Grape, uh, another wonderful combination, <laughs> Berg and Bach, I guess. So uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll have an exciting time with it. Can't wait, and there'll be lots of other other aspects to the to the residency chamber concerts. Uh, Manny's going to play yeah. chamber music with the musicians from the orchestra. He'll be playing Schoenberg's chamber version of Das Lied von der Erde, and and lots of other That's things that that you will you will find out about, and and you can already read about in our materials. And and the Lied von der Erde is of course another connection to the Philharmonic because when I was when I was a kid. Uh, I had an LP of Lied von der Erde in, in college, and I wore out two copies of that recording, Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> so anyway, I hope, I hope we have a wonderful year, and I know that all the concerts that I'm not involved in will be fantastic, so I can't, <laughs> wait, I can't wait to go and listen to as many of them as I can. Uh, I hope you have a great week this week. I'm so sorry not to be there. But uh, I'm, I'm with another great orchestra and looking forward to that. Well, you, you know we're coming to Philadelphia on Friday night, so I don't know if you're around, but maybe we'll uh, be able oh, to say well, hi. Oh, that's great. So maybe we can see each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. I'm sure food would, will be involved, yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll have dinner. <laughs> Sounds fabulous. Thanks, okay. Manny. Thanks for joining us, Manny. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a Take good care. rehearsal. Thanks. Bye. So we, we have not so much time to cover a number of things. Shall we thank Chris for joining us on stage? And uh, thank you, move Chris. On. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, you know, it's 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 always the case, and and I guess I should learn doing these things. There's so many things that we want to talk about, and it's so easy to get get uh, get involved and perhaps too too uh, deeply into one area. But the 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 point is that we we, we really want to show you. Um, Kind of the the process and and the and the feelings behind our decisions, and we're excited about everything we're doing. We'll we'll talk about a few, and you can read about the whole whole season in your in your materials. We should talk about Bach. I was thinking about Bach when 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 Manny mentioned Bach because yes. we're going to be doing a, a lot of Bach. Um, and you've been very close to the the people we've we've. Uh, discussed collaborating with so maybe you can tell us about the idea behind this this festival and I think it really is a fascinating uh, group of concerts well I said earlier that I think one of the things that I felt coming into the Philharmonic was the this idea of a festival within the season was very much a part of the of the planning of the Philharmonic when I got here but um, we're taking a slightly different approach this year I guess which is that in the past the festival has always been presided over by one conductor uh, who really kind of expressed a personal viewpoint or um, a personal passion uh, for Stravinsky in the case of Gergiev, for Bartok and Ligeti and those Hungarian voices with Esapeka. Uh, this season, uh, sh starting shortly, David Zinman will be bringing his particular stamp on Beethoven. And for next season, Alan, we discussed the maybe taking a slightly different tack, which is Bach can be interpreted in so many different ways and has been historically um, that it, we felt it would be interesting to bring together a group of people who would each bring their own viewpoint on Bach and um, sort of reclaim it for the symphony orchestra in a way. Bach is a composer that that for a long time has not been played very often by large symphony orchestras. And, and um, it's something that I've talked about with Zarin and with Ed's predecessors, um, uh, quite a bit actually. You know, what is the best way to bring Bach into the Philharmonic world, back into the Philharmonic world? Um, interestingly, if you read these little one-page profiles of the orchestra musicians, a question that's always asked is, "Who's your favorite composer?" and 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 
the overwhelming majority of the orchestra musicians say Bach, and I think there's a reason for that. There's something that is just towering and and uh, and monumental and just and and universal about Bach. Um, we've all learned a lot from the original instrument movement and the performance practice movement, but I think one unfortunate byproduct of it has been that there's been a sense of, of trepidation that large orchestras have felt because for a long time people have, there was, there was a period and I think the pendulum, pendulum has started to swing back or has actually gone quite far back in the other direction, but there was this idea that there was a right way to play Bach and, and um, people were afraid of, of being blasted for not actually doing it that way. But I've always said that Bach is a composer who can withstand interpretation. And, and I, like that, I like that expression because I, it, it, uh, you know, it implies that it, it sort of pokes fun at this idea that there, there could be a, a right way. But it also, but it also means that it, the, the music is, is open to being played in a lot of different ways. And I think you'll see that in this, in, in this, uh, this um, span of three weeks with Masaaki Suzuki, who's a who's a you know legendary and wonderful Bach conductor um, Bernard Labadie will be will be conducting and I'll be doing the the bath mass in B B minor um, it certainly is music that withstands interpretation I and, and uh, I, it's really nice to see the orchestra musicians so excited about are, being able to to, to play yeah. this music um, our oboe section again. in particular is is uh, very excited about these weeks of Bach and um, I just wanted to mention uh, some crossover things, not in the normal sense, not in the record company sense of the word crossover, but the sense that um, we're very excited to be collaborating with the 92nd Street Y on this Bach examination. Their series of concerts is called Bach Through the Season. And I really want to thank and acknowledge Hannah Aria Geifman, for who's here from the 92nd Street Y, who embraced our idea of the importance of Bach and of presenting many different viewpoints. And she and her organization are presenting a series of uh, instrumental concerts, solo instrumental concerts and recitals and so on and so forth to uh, complement what we're doing. Uh, as Hannah said yesterday at the 92nd Street Y announcement, it's, it's, uh, we're shaking hands across the park. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to do in New York and especially with such a great collaborator as Hannah, so thank you. And I also wanted to mention that Andra Schiff, who's a very important part of our, um, of our family, a very important part of Hannah's family as well, uh, is embarking on a Bach exploration uh, doing the Well-Tempered Clavier at the 92nd Street Y. He'll be conducting and playing Bach concerti uh, with some Mendelssohn and Schumann with us at the Philharmonic, and he has other recitals coming up through future seasons, really survey surveying all of Bach's keyboard music. So we're happy to be a part of that as well. Uh, Masaiki and Bernard were not able to be here, but they did prepare a video. Should we take a look at that just to hear them talk about Bach? Yeah, I want to see what they have to say. <laughs> It's important that this very, very important part of the repertoire be accessible to the New York Phil audience. The major symphony orchestras today, they play very little Bach, and it should really be also an, an integral part of, of their lives. So it's, I really welcome this when, when this comes back. I have never heard of the big, really famous symphony orchestra do this kind of Bach festival. It's essential to view Bach as the founding father of Western classical music. And there had been great music before Bach, and certainly great music after, but I think that all great music has a reference to Bach. You can't understand Bogner symphonies if you don't understand Bach. There's a link, there's a connection, a very clear connection between Bach and a lot of the music that is performed regularly. Bach is one of the rare composers who has uh, very many aspects for any kind of musicians like uh, keyboard instruments or string or singers or whatever. There's something for everyone, both for uh, the performer, for the musicologist, for the, uh, I would almost say the scientist in some cases. Um, it's a music that can really cover a very, very wide range of audiences and, and performers as well.
everybody who, ha who has got ears and eyes and the mind, we all have been influenced by it. And it's a very good thing. Bach's music is both the ending point of a long evolution and the starting point of a new one. Uh, it's amazing to see how little Bach actually invented. He just perfected most of the, the genres and forms that were available. I think it's a very good opportunity to see many different conductors doing Bach in different way and also we can think on Bach's music and the, I think there must be plenty of ways of performing Bach. Some of the audience know this music intimately well, others have never heard it and both will benefit from it. I commend the New York Philharmonic for taking the risk of programming things like that. It's about time that the major uh, American symphony orchestras re reclaim that repertoire, and, and the New York Phil has been doing it for a few years, and I'm happy and proud to be part of that journey. That was nice. That was nice. Um, switching gears yeah. rather dramatically moving to other music that will need to withstand interpretation. <laughs> um, Doug, you, would you like to come join us on stage? Please welcome Doug Fitch. Doug Fitch. <laughs> yes, I would. Thank you. I think most of you know Doug uh, from uh, some things he's done in the past with the Philharmonic. Uh, it's actually quite a few now. Uh, L'Histoire du Soldat, Grand Macabre, of course, has already been mentioned, Cunning Little Vixen. We're not doing a fully staged opera this year. What are we doing? Well, we're taking it from the opera into the ballet world. I think uh, this time we get to do Petrushka. Petrushka is uh, this extraordinary, I think, probably <laughs> one of the original mashups of <laughs> classical music and what came afterward and modern, modernist theory and and dance, and I, it has even been called the, the first ballet gesamt Kunstwerk. So uh, as a threshold piece that was kind of tying together elements of that, that particular cultural milieu, I think it's really exciting to be de doing this in a, in a way that's really new uh, with the entire orchestra present on stage and using, I will say, uh, some, uh, the, the, or the orchestra's a, a number of the characters, hopefully, as well. I, I remember um, the the Rheingold. I'll never forget the Rheingold we did together, and and one of the so I think fun. coup de théâtre that you achieved was um, in the descent to Nibelheim. Um, the 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 way the stage was lit, uh, the the musicians were visible to, to everybody, and there were these golden lights that shone underneath each musician's <laughs> seat, and they came up, and as the musicians were toiling away playing the Nibelheim descent music, it became clear that, oh, these represent the musicians. And I thought that was such an intelligent and, 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 and clever use of the musicians to create this, this, this staging. And are you going to be doing some things a little bit in oh, that direction? Oh, yes, I, I do hope, I think we will. And uh, with um, the, I think it's safe to say that first, I mean, it's, first of all, let me just say how supported I feel by doing this, but getting, getting involved once again in a third time with, uh, me and, and our little uh, company, Giants Are Small, and uh, bringing puppets to the stage of the New York Philharmonic. I don't, I don't know if it's been done before, but uh, I'm really thinking that we're going to put some of the puppets in the hands of the musicians, because I noticed that when you write a symphony, I don't know if you, everybody else knows this, but they write in a lot of rests sometimes, too. <laughs> so I'm going to take full advantage of those rests, and you'll see how. Hmm. Hmm. I, I never get a rest, so... <laughs> Well, you need some batteries for that, I think so. <laughs> Alan, you know, Doug and I were talking yesterday about these projects and it, what we call them, fully staged opera, <laughs> orchestral theater, uh, turning the concert hall into a theatrical experience and how to capture that in some sort of word or title. And it, it struck me that whatever we decide in the long run to call this kind of endeavor that you and Doug have done over the last three years and will continue to do, um, it's a, it's we're kind of inventing a new genre, I think, which is really exciting. What I've what I've enjoyed is is the s fresh relationship our audience can have with the orchestra. It it allows them, causes them, or allows them to 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 
think of the orchestra in a different way. It takes them out of any sense of routine. Um, the orchestra is still playing, and that's a premise of all these projects that it that it they have to include music that the New York Philharmonic can play great, uh, uh, greatly, and 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 um, you know that's the threshold. But but beyond that. If people can see the musicians, like you know, I'll never forget Carter running up the aisle during craft, mm -hmm. or or having musicians around the hall, or or uh, you know the procession in in Grand Macabre. If any time the musicians are able to show a different side of what they do and 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 show what they feel about the music in a different way, I think that's a, that's a, a priori a, a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've always thought that uh, watching a symphony orchestra concert is as, as much a visual thing as it is an audio thing. And, you know, I think we, because we know what an orchestra is, we tend to forget that it was something that was one of the greatest inventions, really, of all time. When you, when you d look down at, at, on the stage, you see that every single one of those instruments is an extraordinary expression of some uh, invention and creativity that came out of a piece of wood or a piece of metal or... And, and that each one of those musicians has spent his life perfecting the ability to perform on that instrument. You watch, and if, if there's a way to, uh, to uh, cause the audience to bring, come to call to attention this as a visual phenomenon, that's what I, I love doing this too. And simply not take it for granted. Take, you know, that's what happened yeah. with the, f the famous cell phone incident. Suddenly the music stopped and people thought, oh, wow. <laughs> It doesn't just go on. They are actually making the music up there, and it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's a really. Just thinking, he was one of the composers. I thought he was. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But the, no, anything that I mean, I'm not saying I'm glad that happened, but but just <laughs> anything that I'm really not glad that happened. But but <laughs> but but but, uh, but you know, it did have the 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 effect, and I would even say to an extent, the benefit of making people realize, oh, wow. This is just not something that you can take for granted. So that's yeah. that's it's all part of this kind of uh, thought that uh, I'm that uh, I think we're working on together. Yeah, it's really exciting to be doing this uh, with you guys a third time. So looking forward enormously. S so are we. <laughs> so are we. Thanks, Doug. You're very welcome. I should. I know we're running out of time, Alan, but I think that uh, I think that we should say that uh, it's interesting how the end of the twelve thirteen season came together. As I said, Zarn and Alan and I sit around and we throw ideas on the table and we talk about pieces that we're passionate about and that Alan has been wanting to do and and so on. And we always like the end of a season to be a crescendo, if you will, to build to some sort of climax, um, which. Doug's treatment of Petrushka certainly will be, but when we looked at the span of the whole month of June of, at the end of the 12-13 season with um, Il Prigioniero and collaborating with the Jazz, at Link, uh, the jazz Orchestra of Lincoln Center and um, bringing Chris's piece seeing back and combining it with, I mean, all these things started to develop into a month-long, very personal vision of, of music that that I think you brought to the to the planning process. Yeah, it, it, in a way, I can't take credit for it if there's anything to take credit for because it was somewhat incidental. Um, but I will say that we were trying to make the end of the season, as Ed said, something special, and there were just too many things we wanted to do. So it was Ed that encouraged me. Well, let's maybe we can do this the week before, and this idea of this final event of the season kind of spilled and seeped earlier and earlier and finally became a month-long event. And yeah. so uh, you guys had the idea of actually calling it that. And yeah. uh, it's, yeah, it, does, it does represent things that we're really passionate about. No, kind of when we took a step, step back from the planning and lo looked at it, it, I realized, you know, this is exactly what Alan probably has on his iPod and is listening to for his pleasure and for his interest. And, and so we've decided to call it Gilbert's playlist, uh, the month of June. And um, I think it'll be really fun and a great way to end the season. I can't wait. Yeah. Good. Zarin, do you want to come back and uh, try to hit the points that we've, uh, I mean, there's so many. Neglected, but, uh, yeah. missed. Yeah, it's a lot, I know. But. Well, I really wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the tour that will take place in 1213. Um, I just want to read this. It's going to be the tenth tour under the aegis of Credit Suisse, the fifth tour already with Alan, 
as their music director in the seventh tour with Alan in four years. Seventh tour. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And those are all international tours. <clears throat> this tour has some particular high points that I wanted to talk about. Uh, we'll be going back to Turkey, to Izmir and to Istanbul for the first time in 18 years. Our soloists will be Manny and Josh playing Mozart and Bernstein that we've talked about. Uh, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Konzerthaus in Vienna uh, with three concerts there. And something very unusual, uh, some of you may remember that in 2005, we were invited to Dresden to play in the, for the opening of the Frankreich, which was reconstituted after the bombing, the waning days of the war. And it was a tripartite concert with us as the Americans, a British composer, Colin Matthews, who wrote a piece for a Dresden cellist, Jan Fogler. And that was premiered there. And one of the emotional highlights of my career here was coming out of that church after that first night when Lauren conducted the Death and Transfiguration and seeing what those people felt. That tour was sponsored by the Volkswagen company. Now, that may not mean much, except they built a factory outside Dresden after the wall came down, which is called the Transparent Factory. And this is a place where they put together cars, and it's really quite amazing to see it. I'm not a technical person, but I was fascinated walking to see how a car is put together from beginning to end. And this factory became famous not only for that innovation, but a couple of years before that, when the Elbe River overflowed and the Semper Opera could not be used, they transferred the opera performances to the factory. Uh, they did lots of receptions for us, and the idea came a year ago, actually to Alan, naturally, saying, wouldn't it be a wonderful place to do craft? So we're going to f try and find scrap metal in Germany. That's going to be hard. <laughs> Dirty scrap metal. No, I, form. I'm sorry, Marcus Rotem would say the junk in Germany is clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're going to go a couple of weeks before scavenge around, and we're going to perform craft in the factory. So that, to me, is going to be one of the highlights of your career, I'm sure. Well, it's, I mean, it's actually, it's kind of an obvious idea, I think, because craft is about construction, and, yes. and, and, and it takes musical sounds and turns them literally into the building blocks of the piece. So we'll, uh, we'll be building our own, own structures there. I will come. <laughs> um, Credit Suisse has been an extremely important part of our life for the last so many years, and it's because of them that we're able to plan these kinds of tours, and it's a wonderful luxury that we have, and we hope and may it continue forever. Um, Antonio Quintella, who is the head of North America and South America, and on our board couldn't be here, but he's asked me to read a statement to all of you. The launch of the new season is an important event and I'm sorry I'm unable to join you all today. As the New York Philharmonic's exclusive global sponsor, Credit Suisse is delighted once again to support the orchestra's coming season of exciting programs. Credit Suisse's long-standing commitment to the arts, which extends back through our 150-year history, is an important demonstration of our desire to contribute to the cultural life of the communities in which we live and work. Our partnership with the New York Philharmonic aligns us closely with another historic institution that shares similar values and traditions, such as our mutual focus on performance excellence and engagement with our communities. Since 2007, we have been privileged to join the Philharmonic for concerts and special gatherings here in New York and in numerous cities abroad. Many of my colleagues overseas are already looking forward to the upcoming Europe tour of spring 2013. We are particularly pleased that the next tour will offer opportunities in our home market of Zurich, and so many of our clients and employees can experience the exceptional talents of Alan Gilbert and the orchestra's musicians. The opportunity to share such wonderful and much appreciated cultural experiences is just one of many reasons our partnership with the New York Philharmonic has been so successful. Congratulations on this exciting new season. Well, we all thank 
Mr. Quintella and his colleagues on this tour that we just did. Uh, they did client events and supported us through advertising and various ways, which was quite incredible. So this is not just a commercial venture. They really believe in the New York Philharmonic, and I think we believe in Credit Suisse. I'm delighted to reconfirm that Alec Baldwin, who unfortunately could not be with us, will return as our on-air host for this week with the New York Philharmonic. And Alec is getting busier and busier, but he says, I'm going to do the New York Philharmonic. That's my prime objective in life. <laughs> so we're thrilled. Now, we've come to the end. I don't think, do you have anything else to say? Shall we throw it open to questions? I see some questions coming in via Twitter. Oh, they're oh, written great. questions. Wow, Twitter questions. What do you think is the most important program of next season? Um, well, the whole season I think of as a, as a big, big program, and I'm not just being flip about this. It's, it's um, you know, we can't contain all our ideas in one event, and I try to think about programs as a sort of localized event, and then an event that, that spans weeks as is obvious when there's a festival, but it doesn't always have to be obvious. But they're longer and longer spans. And, and even over a period of three, and now we can even talk about four years, um, it somehow should present a mosaic portrait of what we feel about music and what we want to play as an orchestra and what we feel our audiences should hear. Um, so, you know, it's like choosing a, a, a favorite child in a way, um, you know, I. I'm happy with um, every single program we've made. Um, I guess I'm excited about the programs that we've talked about, mm -hmm. um, and I urge you to to look at the uh, the, the actual listing. Um, you know, we could have gone through lists of guest conductors. We have have Lauren Mazel coming back, Kurt Mazur coming back, David Robertson is doing an incredible program. Um, there are a lot of a lot of events that 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 I think are going to be really exciting, and I sincerely do hope that every single night will feel like an event. Um, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, for us anyway, we don't have to choose one program, and we play them all, and we play them all as beautifully as we can, and I, I look forward to seeing all of you at as many of them as, as possible. You know, I, we have a colleague who says that the great organizing principle in the arts is a brochure deadline, because honestly, Alan and Zarn and I can sit around and play with programs endlessly and, oh, we can, if we did this, this would be a little bit better. Or if we move this here, you know, maybe that would make more sense. And we really could go on like that forever. And then our colleagues in marketing and PR remind us that it's time to settle down and, and announce the season. So No, and, it, and, and it, it almost feels like an arbitrary point. Okay, that's the way it stands. And we did literally make changes up until the last, uh, last second. And I think improvements up until the last second. But finally, we had to just say, okay, that's the way it yeah. is. And, yeah. presented to you guys. Yeah. Um, Christopher Rouse, known for his loud music. <laughs> More to come? <laughs> well, it's going to never change its spots. It's going to never change its spots. There'll be some more to I think I would change the adjective loud to visceral. That's one of the things I love about your music, Chris. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm doing I'm doing your violin concerto this week, and I haven't done it before. And and uh, um, I wa I was thinking about this yesterday as, as I was studying it. With with all important and great composers, there's something that's immediately identifiable in the sound, and your music definitely has that. It's clear. Okay, that's a piece by Chris. Yeah. Uh, I think that we have to wrap things up, don't we? Yeah, a couple from the audience, maybe. Yeah. Uh, with the redevelopment of Lincoln Center has been really tremendously successful overall, but what about Avery Fisher Hall renovation? Is, is that just totally on the back burner now? There no, no, it's not on the back burner, Tony. We've um, uh, formed a committee between Lincoln Center and ourselves to start the planning process. They still have some money to raise for what they've done already, as you say, beautifully, and so it has to follow on to that. But 
I have no doubt it will happen. Totally separate uh, fundraising project, isn't it? I'm for Fisher Hall, that's not no, related it, to No, it will be a joint fundraising between the uh, Philharmonic and Lincoln Center. Definitely. I think there's somebody one more in the, in the back. back. How are you, Christian Can you speak into the microphone, sure. please? Your calendar seems a little more um, edgy this year. Is that a conscious, conscious decision you go into to bring in a wider audience? Uh, you're referring to the season we're announcing now? Well, I, you know, I... If if that's how it comes off, then I guess that's that's a good thing. It's not it's not really what we're we're trying to do. We we try to put together programs that we really believe in, and and uh, we're not specialists. We're not trying to tick off boxes uh, of 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 numbers of types of music we should play, or um, there are no there are no quotas. We just try to put together programs that are well crafted and tell a story and illuminate the pieces um, that we play and that's what we do period uh, we're not we're not uh, doing anything actually to satisfy any agenda and so um, these programs really are a reflection of what we want to play and it will shift from one year to the next because uh, you know people's interests you know one one year you'll you know you'll read more mystery novels and other years you might read you know more classics or whatever i mean it it it's just it goes in waves and luckily we're able to talk about long time spans so that over time eventually we we i think we cover a, a huge range of music and that's one of the hallmarks of the new york philharmonic the ability to play an incredible range of music really compellingly that was one of the things that was one of the comments that actually was repeatedly um, spoken on on the tour, we played a lot of different music, and people said, wow, the orchestra sounds so different for each style and each composer of music. And I think the New York Philharmonic, as New York, as the city in which we, we live, is a real collection of, of different um, cultures and values and abilities and interests, and we try, uh, on some level, to, to reflect that all the time. <clears throat> Chester Lane, Symphony Magazine. Um, a while ago, Alan was talking about Ives Fourth Symphony, um, and I, I've I've read about this. I think it was the Fourth Symphony that was uh, considered by one conductor so difficult that he needed a second conductor for part of it. Is this I, is that is that a fact? And if, uh, do you have any comment on the challenges of conducting this piece? Um, it's yeah, it's really hard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Please don't put ideas uh, in his head. <laughs> no, no. Actually, we do it. We, we will do it with a, a second conductor, and 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 I think. Um, uh, some conductors, uh, you know, Seiji Ozawa actually said once, he said, first time I did the piece, two conductors. Then I tried it with one conductor. Next time, no conductors. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably going to be the best performance. Um, but um, it can be done uh, with, um, with, with one conductor, but I actually think dramaturgically it's tells the story more clearly when there are two conductors, because that's how Ives composes. There are two completely different things going on at the same time. They have to line up, um, but um, they are not connected, actually. And so to have two different conductors makes that point so clear, and it also takes the heat off of, 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 the, uh, of, the, uh, of me, really. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, Alan, uh, when you were assistant of the Cleveland Orchestra, you made your Salzburg debut as the second conductor in Ives' Unanswered Question. <laughs> that was literally the scariest conducting performance I've ever done, because we were up in the... In the uh, the uh, the feels right in Schule. Yeah, up and up up behind the stage, and we had to climb up this very narrow staircase, and there was literally no room. And the only thing that was keeping us from falling off to our certain death was the were these small wires that were connected, and there was almost no room. So um, I'm glad I made it through that performance. You've you've, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to close this off because uh, we have brunch. I know it's not Sunday, but you're invited to Wednesday brunch. Right over there. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you. Out.